to um, wilderness survival. Somebody later suggested this would have been a, a more attended talk had we called it Engineers Gone Wild, but uh, <laughs> it was after the fact, so, uh, so here we are. So what I want to cover today is I want to cover um, practical survival for people who aren't seasoned wilderness people. If you're a seasoned wilderness person, I guarantee you'll walk away with several things you didn't know today. Um, I think there's a lot of um, focus on the survival kits that exist are in the area of, oh, you know, here's how to make a fishing line and blah, blah, blah. And the reality is that if you're lost and somebody knows you're lost, there are people looking for you. And that's search and rescue. So actually what I want to do is I want to present this from a perspective of how do you sustain yourself and how do you make it easier for us to find you? If in fact you go someplace and you haven't told somebody where you're going and you haven't told them when you're going to be back, some of this may not apply. <laughs> so, so the first thing is um, dressing in the wilderness. And uh, we say in search and rescue all the time, cotton kills. And uh, it draws a lot of, oh, there was one right there, a raised eyebrow, like cotton kills, how can that be? Well, what you should wear in the wilderness is 100% non-natural fibers or wool. Cotton is really the worst possible thing you can wear. When it gets wet, it stays wet, and it holds up moisture right against your skin. And certainly in this area, the thing you'll be fighting the most to sustain yourself is keeping your core temperature up. So if you actually are wearing cotton and it's gotten wet, you might, you'd be better off naked. Don't recommend that approach, but you'd be better off naked. So, so first of all, um, we tend to wear, in, in our wilderness kits, we tend to wear a mix, pan on the mouth, it's called a BDU. Um, Stands for battle dress uniform, but it's not camouflage. But it's, a, it's half cotton, half polyester. It's kind of a blend. It's got all this special anti-rip stuff in it. And then on the top, we wear completely um, polyester uh, shirts, because obviously this is where your core temperature is. Core temperature, I should actually define, is really not your core. People think this is your core, and you got to keep this warm. It's really this. There's really three organs that you care about in this context. Um, there is your, your heart, your lungs, and your brain. And when uh, those three, you know, when they, start run, when they start having troubles, everybody starts having troubles. So, um, so you'll often see people talk about, if your feet are cold, put on a better hat. Because this is where you lose most of your heat from. So um, we'll go into that a little bit more. So what we'd like you to wear in the wilderness looks like this. Because when we're trying to find you, we want to know where you are. And, you know, this might be a, you know, batteries not included. Um, but actually, we tend to wear, ourselves, tend to wear things like this. Um, long sleeves, that, they don't have that in long sleeve, otherwise I would have shown you that one. But uh, we tend to wear this um, because the, the reality is when you need to stay warm, you need to stay warm. So you need long sleeves. We, anytime we're doing search, searches, um, they're always where there's more poison oak than you can ever imagine. So um, if you want to know how to avoid poison oak, come talk to me later. Um, so, and choosing bright colors is really great. <clears throat> it actually brings up an interesting conflict, which is that uh, if you choose colors that happen to be similar to the colors of pollinating flowers, you will attract bees. So be aware. Uh, I don't know that this color is found in nature, so you may be okay with this. Um, so um, we do sometimes things called PSAR, which is a funny phrase. It stands for preventative search and rescue. And the idea behind PSAR is, a small amount of education can go a long way to having people just not get lost. So I'm going to start with how not to get lost, which sounds really obvious, but there are some things that you don't realize until you've actually experienced it. First of all, things look different. When you left on your uh, walk and it was, the sun was just coming up, things look a lot different when the sun's going down. So the perspective of the sun is going to change the, the appearance of the terrain. If you're on a trail, and I think some of you probably had the experience to be walking along on a trail, and, and you'll get to the end, or you'll decide that you know, you're only going to spend three hours, and it's been an hour and a half, so you're going to turn around and go back. You go back, and suddenly you realize there's a fork in the trail. And it's like, where did that come from? I didn't see that fork coming out. Well, those are the kinds of things that catch people, because then they're really sure they know which of the two forks it is. And I think you'd be surprised uh, that it's less than 50% they get the right answer. So the, an so, so the solution is actually a simple one which is anytime you have a 
a terrain change. So if you're walking along and then suddenly you're, you know, you're kind of going uphill and then suddenly you flatten out or you're walking along and suddenly you start to dip or you're walking along and it starts to bank to the left or you're walking along and it starts to bank to the right, stop, turn around and see what it looks like going the other direction. That is probably the most important thing. If, if you don't learn anything today, that's the most important thing. Well, next to telling people where you're going and when you'll be back. Um, it's surprising how many people actually don't realize they're lost because they're sure they know their way back. And then by the time they realize they're lost, it's starting to get dark and then it, it's a much, much more dangerous situation, not only because of the cold, but because they're not equipped to actually deal with the fact that it's going to be dark and they're going to be trying to sustain themselves. So uh, it's often better to figure out that you're lost and start acting uh, within two hours from sundown. Rough way to check for two hours is you hold a hand at a distance and uh, two hands is two hours. Kind of a rough, a rough way to do it. I suppose if you're uh, in Alaska that's <laughs> in summer, that can be a, I don't know, really big hand maybe. Um, so let me look at the, my ordering here. Okay, so once lost. So I wanna cover, I wanna cover signaling, and I'm using somebody's uh, kit here. But I wanna cover signaling, and I wanna cover it from a couple of different perspectives. And, wasn't the one I wanted, but. I didn't go shopping just before the talk started, I swear. Um, so, signaling with a mirror is one of the most effective ways to signal in the daytime, okay? And, and when the sun's shining. Um, signaling with a mirror can actually get a signal 20 to 30 miles easily. It's not uncommon at all for people to see a 20 to 30 mile signal. Anybody have any idea what the longest known rescue was initiated with a signal mirror? Just anyone? It's 105 miles. Those are somewhat ideal circumstances. Probably a Coast Guard, uh, uh, Coast Guard makes an especially you know, large and glass flat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, nothing in nature is flat. so. If something's reflecting, it's man-made, and people know that. So before you can learn how to signal with a mirror, first of all, you have to figure out who you're signaling to, and that may be aircraft, that may be hikers, that may just be that you're signaling to an area that you believe to be uh, uh, inhabited. Either it, you know, there's power lines that you can see in the distance that are there, or whatever, because you may, in fact, not be mobile. You may have hurt yourself and you need to signal. Um, so the first thing is figure out who you want to signal. The second thing is, uh, if you're going to signal effectively, you need to know if you're right-eyed or left-eyed. Right-eyed or left-eyed. Um, <clears throat> the longer version of that is right-eye dominant or left-eye dominant. So I bet most of you don't know, if you're a hunter and you're firing a weapon, um, you probably know intuitively whether you're right-eyed or left-eyed because if you're right-handed and left-eyed, you're going to be a terrible shot using traditional position. So the way you can tell is, Put your hands together and make an opening, hold it up, pick an object that's somewhere in the distance, whatever, and if you think you're right-eyed, i.e. if you're right-handed, close your left eye, and if the object does not jump out of way, then the eye that's still open is your dominant eye. If you switch, you'll suddenly realize that when you're looking just through your non-dominant eye, the thing just jumps completely out of the way. I think, does everybody, everybody kind of get that? Make sense? You got it? Or? Are you ambidextrous? <laughs> so, okay, so I'm, I'm, if you're right-handed, you're generally right-eyed. If you're left-handed, you're generally left-eyed. If you're actually one of the crossover positions, excuse me, you'll see hunters who are this, who are right-handed and left-eyed. If they look this way, they're actually not looking with their dominant eye and they're not gonna hit anything. So they actually have to lean across the barrel and look down with their other eye. So um, if you ever see somebody doing that, you'll know that they're a, there's probably a term for that. I don't know what it is. Okay. So if we had a simulated sun here, eh, no, no chance. Um, so here's the deal. I'm right-handed and right-eyed. So I'm going to put this. You want a flashlight somewhere? <laughs> nah, it's okay. I think people will get the, get the, get the drift. So um, I'm right-handed and right-eyed. So I'm going to put the mirror right up next to my eyes, close as I can. And I'm going to make what you would think of as a rear sight. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to close my, my non-dominant eye. I'm gonna find the thing that I want to signal, 
And as I make this, as I, I align the sun, I will actually see the, sun, the, the flash across my fingers. And this is how you aim. And though it starts out little here, it ends up being pretty large over there. Um, so, the, so this mechanism is quite successful. And one of the things you want to do once you kind of get it going is you want to do patterns of three. Three is actually the international distress symbol. Three of any, anything is the international distress symbol. I'm going to segue that into this little bit of a tangent. I'm going to segue. Anybody know what SOS stands for? Nothing. 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 So SOS, uh, they wanted to basically come up with a signal that was three threes, right? And so they and they and with Morse code, there's da dashes and dots. So then they said, okay, we want these three threes to be in the smallest space possible. So that means three dots, three dashes because they're longer, and three dots. And, was, and the idea there is that anybody who really doesn't know anything about Morse code is going to recognize that pattern. Um, and somebody later said, well, actually, if you divide that into three pieces, the first one would be an S, the second one's an O, and the third one is an S. Um, but it's actually not done with spaces. So if you're into Morse code, you won't actually ever hear that space between them. SOS is just was some kind of reverse engineered uh, you know, acronym that came up. So. So this is actually a really, really good way to communicate to somebody where you are in the daytime. In the nighttime, and, um, and this, was, this was something I, I, I learned not too long ago from actually uh, one of our special forces friends. So I love this one. Um, this is, well, let's grab a different one. These are chemical light sticks. Chemical light sticks, uh, are really wonderful for, for this application. This says it expired <laughs> uh, 5 of 95, OK? So I'm going to prove to you that it hasn't expired. And uh, I don't know why they have such aggressive expiration dates on it, but if you're frugally minded, you know they, they dump these things when they get closer to the expiration date. And as you can see, 12 years later, it still works. So, so it'll be really embarrassing if it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> so. I am going to steal something here. It's almost the problem having too many toys in front of you. You can't decide which one you want to show. OK. So by the way, does, uh, how many of you have trouble with your cordage that it gets tangled? This is the way to go. I don't know what this is called. It's probably knitting <laughs> by some people's standards. Um, but it's a really, really incredible. First thing I do whenever I get cordage is immediately weave it up like that. And it never, never gets uh, tangled. So. OK. So what's that? The daisy chain. Is that what that's called? I never really knew what it was called. I just know, what to, know how to do it. So. Works well with extension cords, too. Yeah, absolutely. So in fact, this, this case, uh, you can do it a single or a double. So in the case of a double, right? And what's, it's just wonderful. All I can say is it's just wonderful. Um, and it doesn't take long to do. So you know, I don't actually have to undo the whole thing. I just thought I'd do it. It was fun. So when signaling uh, during the night, you want to be seen, you may want to be seen by aircraft overhead, or you may in fact want to be seen by somebody who is actually at a peer level with you, or even potentially below you. This actually is quite bright, and it has, uh, uh, the human eye tends to notice uh, things which are perfect, perfect circles, perfectly straight lines. They don't exist in nature, right? So this, apparently, the Special Forces guys really elongate this thing, like to you know, 10 feet or something. And um, Telos can actually see them quite nicely. <laughs> Some of us like to live dangerously. So, um, and then what's really nice is that you can make a signal. This will also, uh, they have different hours, and they have different uh, uh, brightnesses. So for signaling, they have some that only last two hours but are unbelievably bright. Uh, they make smaller ones, longer ones. These chemical light sticks are your friend. And they have a very long shelf life, as you can see. So um, I will get into hypothermia a little bit, or more than a little bit. I'm just sort of going with the, the uh, prop-oriented things a, a little bit first here. So that's just called daisy chain. Now I, now I know what that's called. OK. Um, the part of what prompted me to sort of propose this talk was the family that got lost uh, 
the Kim family, right? And, uh, and some of the things they did were, you know, in our, in our search and rescue community, you can imagine the kinds of conversations that are happening. And um, one of the things that he did was he left, but he didn't pick a particular direction, and he didn't uh, stick on that direction, and he didn't mark where he had actually been. So uh, I thought I was going to be able to buy more of these today to show off. Um, this is called flagging tape. I I'm actually tell you the truth, I forget what community uses. Arborist, maybe? I'm, I'm not sure. Is that what it is? Okay. Okay, and this is the friendly kind that biodegrades in the sun after a few days, a few, few weeks, few months, whatever. Um, this is actually, <laughs> this is really good stuff, but this is kind of a, a chunky size, right? I mean, you don't, you don't want to have this in your survival kit. So um, what we do, uh, what we do with uh, our friend duct tape is the same thing we'll actually do with this. So um, what we do with duct tape, and duct tape is your friend in your survival kit, this is going to be one of the most important things in your kit, believe it or not. We, you know, you have a big roll of duct tape, which is, you know, go to Costco and you can't walk out with more than seven of these, okay? Um, we wind off onto something small, and you, you know, you only need maybe 20, 25 feet or something. What I did here was I took some post-it notes, thank you Google, wrapped it around a pencil, wound it off. Is that considered fair use or, you know, reasonable? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Um, and. Uh, and so it's literally just kind of a soft cord center, but what's really nice is it's very small. So uh, we do the same thing with this. We wind off you know, a few feet of this, and the idea is every 100 meters, you tear off something and tie it, so that if somebody's following you, they're just every, they're gonna know that you're gonna do it every 100 meters, right? So um, you can do that by counting steps. Uh, I tend to just count left steps. So, and you know, what, what is it the, uh, I'm trying to remember what it is. It's, uh, it's like, I, th I, think, I think I'm, fi yeah, I think, I th I'm trying to remember if, if I was like at 55, I'm trying to remember the numbers now, was I at 55 or something, I forget, but point is that sometime when you're near a football field, just kind of pace out and you'll know kind of how far that is, and then you just literally tie this kind of stuff off, and it doesn't take much, and it's pretty bright, uh, I really want them to make it in this color. <laughs> um, and uh, communicating where you've been and communicating where you're going is really important. So the other thing is, if you're in a place, and this is harder in the, in, the, um, in the winter, but you want to communicate where you're going, or, where you, or at least where you think you're going, the directionality. So again, nature does not have anything that's perfect. So take a row of something, logs, rocks, anything, and make a straight line. If you make a straight line, aircraft flying over will see it. People on foot, if they have any altitude at all, will see it. Um, do, make something that's perfect. <laughs> If you want uh, to get the attention because you're actually in trouble, go with something like a triangle, an equilateral triangle, that's three of something, and it's a perfect shape, okay? So, um, so and these things don't take uh, a lot of effort. In, in many cases, you can, you know, if you can find something to build this out of, you can communicate that, you know, where you are and what you're doing. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna, jump, I'm gonna jump around a little bit here. So anybody have any ideas what they do at uh, refugee camps for, uh, for purifying water? They have, you know, a few thousand people suddenly show up and they can't give them all hand purifiers. Anybody have any, any idea? Pretty close. I think I told you this the other day, didn't I? And you still got it wrong. Um, <laughs> I, they literally stop to a pool supply store on the way, and they buy 50-pound bags, not this size. This is the small one, by the way. 50-pound uh, bags of chlorine and 50-pound bags of alum. Now, I've used chlorine for years, and um, alum is something new. I've never tried this before. Alum is a coagulant. Who was that that told me? Thank you. <laughs> I was like, it makes things stick together and sink to the bottom. Um, so what they do is they basically take some amount of water, chlorinate it, then once they've killed off everything, they put the alum in, that causes things to coagulate, settle to the bottom. If you're, ideally you're in direct sunlight, you give it a couple of hours for the coagulant to dissipate. You can give it up to a couple of days for the chlorine to dissipate. Chlorine um, will, if, if left uncovered, will dissipate. So what you've killed off, you know, you won't have to, if you're willing to wait a little while, you won't have to drink water that smells like or tastes like chlorine. 
what's nice about this is it's uh, you put one of these in your kit. Oh, that's strong. <laughs> People will never sit in the front next time, will they? Um, you put these in your kit, and I bought, uh, and I, I want everybody to grab one on the way home. Um, I actually bought like little tiny Ziploc bags, right? <laughs> Can you smell it? Is it that bad? Okay, I'll put it away. You guys get the idea, the size here. Um, this will actually purify about 1,000 gallons. So just think about the space cost trade-off of that versus filter. They have to like, you know, make sure it doesn't get clogged, they have to blah, blah, blah. That is, bang for the buck, the best way to go in terms of how to purify water. Um, so then you say, okay, great, now I've got, I've got water purification mechanism. All I have to do is carry along my 1,000 gallon container. <laughs> I'm sure there's like a tricky way to open this, but. Um, but, you know, you need, you need something to actually collect water in. So this goes in your kit. This is a very useful thing that's in your kit because you can make any kind of shape out of it. If you're trying to collect water from an unusual location, if you have a fixed shape item, it's sometimes hard to get the opening of your fixed shape item in the appropriate place to catch water, be it water that's dripping or whatever. It also can be used for cooking. So um, again, what you put in your kit is something we, we, we can buy in bulk. By the way, I'm not selling kits. I'm not selling kits at all. I, I, my, my theory here is that if kits aren't cheap and if they aren't small, people won't carry them. And if they don't carry them, they don't help them. So uh, one of my goals here is to actually make the kits so small that they will fit. It's a, it's a two-part kit, and each part will fit in your pocket. So the, the, and this is kind of the size I'm shooting for. Um, this is the size that I'm shooting for. Uh, basically kind of two things of this size. I think these are like back to school, you know, like you put your erasers in here, rubbers to some of you. Um, so speaking of that, these aren't made for what we're going to use them for. Um, but they are tough. They're made for a rough environment. <laughs> so make sure you get the kind without any of the extra goodies, OK? Um, these are a great, compact way to carry water. Uh, once you've collected it, you can put it in here and carry it. And uh, according to the guy at the pool store, this is not so caustic that it will eat through this. You know, it will take a couple of weeks for it to it. You should be home within a couple of weeks. So um, we like to actually pick things in our search and rescue kit or in our survival kit that are multi-purpose, OK? <laughs> uh, so let's talk a little bit about heat retaining. And uh, yeah, I can't bend, so I'm going to have you just. So um, open this up and get into the heat, heat retaining position, which is you're, you're trying to lower, you're trying to reduce your surface area. So you, I don't know if you call it fetal position, but when you're down and you basically, the only part of your body that's touching is your boots. You are wearing boots in the wilderness, right, folks? OK. Um, now, mind you, his hands are warm, OK? If you wait until your hands are really cold, your space blankets are not going to be your friend. You are going to spend a long time unwinding your space blankets. So these are like, you know, you, you uh, didn't leave. So, you know, there you are. <laughs> What's that? Am I cowering here? Yeah, now you, now you uh, just, you know, over your head, right on. Right. And then you get down into this, yep. And so the idea here is that you're actually um, lowering your total profile. You're actually, these are wind resistant. These reflect your heat back. They are unbelievably light. I'm going to get them further back there. Got to get a better arm. Oh, oh over the fence. Um, and also, this has a, um, a, a reflective side. Now, you should actually keep the reflective side in. But in fact, if you have craft or somebody coming by, you can flip this around. This is not something found in nature. So this also draws attention to yourself. Thank you. And uh, if any of you have actually experienced space blankets, there is now 
a new generation, not the ones I threw out are actually ones I had in my stock, but these are these are new generations. We can hand this around if people are interested. It's a, it doesn't crinkle as much. It's a, a it feels a little more plastic, a um, little more, it's a little more durable. So it's practical to actually make shelters out of that. It's a little, it was a little harder with the pure mylar untreated ones because they were really noisy and really once they start to rip, they you know they really go. So. Say again. Yeah. How do you put a safe amount? Because it's poison in too much. You got it. Um, now if I can find that toy. Uh, so what I what I actually intended to buy but couldn't find them in short order um, is this is a scalpel blade, and a scalpel blade is one of the most important tools in a survival kit. Is a knife if you know how to use it, um, and in fact if if I can only take one tool into the wilderness and and use it to survive, it would be a knife. For this kit, I wanted to make the kit so small that you would carry it. So in fact, just carrying a blade means that you can affix it to a handle if you need to. And in many cases, you're trying to do something fine enough that you, maybe you don't even need a handle. So what I brought um, were exacto blades. You know, this, uh, this didn't seem like there was that much stuff in it when I started, but. <laughs> so uh, I actually, because they're sharp, I put them in a, you know, special container. Um, if you see me going, ouch, ouch, you'll know what happened. So, okay, they are here, and you'll have to just trust me on that. On your way out, uh, I want people to come by and, you know, pick up a little plastic bag, pick up their chlorine, you know. Basically, you're going to be able to make a kit on your way out of here. And I had, uh, I asked REI if they would give me a bunch of bags when I was there. I mean, I wasn't there just before I started the talk. But if I were, they gave me a bunch of bags. and. Uh, and so you can actually make kits on your way out. If I had more time, I would have made them beforehand, but instead you'll get to be hands-on. So the answer to your question is, you use uh, one of these uh, exacto knife blades, and you essentially just scrape in a very small amount. Right? And the point is, is that if you put in too much, one, you won't be able to drink it, because it will, just, it will really be truly repulsive. Iodine has a danger, because iodine doesn't have much of flavor, and if you overdo iodine, you can shut down your, I always forget which one, kidney, li liver, kidney, which one is it? One of those organs, one of the things you need. Um, and, so, uh, and so I don't like to use iodine because if you overdo it, you don't know it until it's too late. Um, and with the alum, I actually don't know. This is a bit of an experiment for me uh, here as well. So, uh, so we'll, you know, we'll, uh, we'll read the instructions and see what it says. So I'm a little bit old school in this stuff, so um, <clears throat> I don't even know if you can go to a pool store and get bromine. And uh, you can? Okay. Because I actually, um, the, the reason I like this stuff is that it's, it's, it's uh, stable, and they've actually put um, stabilizers in here. So these things have a shelf life of, I don't know, five years or something. In the older days, chlorine, they didn't have it stabilized, and if it was in powder, if it was in this tablet form, it would only be good for a few months before it would start to, to go bad or whatever chlorine does when it stops doing what it's supposed to do. Um, so, so in that case, the, um, uh, so in that case, I don't, I don't really know if bromine is better or not, but I know that if you go to like REI or whatever and you buy all these like individual little, you know, tablets, now you're in this position where I've got this tablet and how much water should I put it in or do I break the tablet or not? It's better to start with something big and then just kind of shave off what you need. That thing will last you, you know, many years. <laughs> so, how are we doing on time? Because you have any idea here? Oh, so we're halfway. Okay. Um, okay. So finding water. I talked to you about purifying water. How about finding it? Probably should have done it in the other order here. Um, so there's several ways to find water. And one of the best ways is to actually get up early and get, um, take a um, bandana and actually go collect it off things which have collected dew. That's a very, very convenient way to go about it. Also, if you get up and think, and it's frozen, it's water, right? So that's another way is to find, uh, you know, uh, the nice thing about it is that if it freezes, you know, only kind of theoretically H2O freezes. So some of the things that might have settled at the bottom may not be part of what freezes, depending on the temperature and such. So, um, so another thing is to go grab the ice that's out there, collect it. Um, don't pop ice in your mouth. People, um, people think that when they're in the wilderness and they find snow, that they need water, they just, you know, pop it in there. If you can, 
melt it first because it takes a lot of calories for your body to deal with the fact that you've just put all this cold water in your mouth or cold ice in your mouth. And, uh, and now you have to replace those calories with, with food and that's probably something that you're having a hard time with at that point in time. So people sometimes call it the rule of three. Sometimes, I don't really think it's threes, it's more like fours. You can last uh, four minutes without air. You can last four days without water. You can last four weeks without food. So if you realize four days versus four weeks, food is not your most important priority. And if you ever get a survival kit from somebody and it has you know, sugar or any food type inside of it, take it out. The number of people who've been uh, accosted by bears because the survival kit they have, they didn't know actually had you know, sugar in it. Thank God, sugar's gonna save my life. You know? um, bears, bears have such good sense that they can actually smell the sweetener in toothpaste. And uh, you know, so uh, if you decide you wanna brush your teeth in the wild, take baking soda with you. Don't take anything that has a sweetener in it. You'd be surprised how many things sweetener finds its way into. So, except for like that Tom's of Maine, that stuff not, not very sweet at all. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, sure. And by the way, you're free to interrupt me just as long as you remember where I was. So, so I mean, uh, that, what you just said makes great sense if you're really deep in the wilderness or whatever. There are different kinds of survival kits Absolutely. that you can In some situations, you know, having food is probably a good thing. Are there better foods that don't have sweet? Like, what would you recommend as a very stable food that will last a long time in case you forget to change it, that you stick in somewhere, you know, for day outings kind of thing where? So, we, so <clears throat> part of the reason why I sort of didn't want to include food besides the bear aspect is that we have so many really good, you know, energy bars and things like that that, you know, are sealed and are dry and you know blah blah and they'll last forever and they have really good carb content stuff. I think that for most people uh, when they get into a panic situation they're going to burn more glycogen and they're going to need more glycogen because that's what your brain essentially requires is glycogen. You, if you run out of glycogen, you know, if you're working out and you just run out of sugar, you pass out, right? You'll never run out of fat. So, um, so having hard candy in your having hard candy available is a, is a really good um, thing to have in a kit. If you know, I tend to think of them as you have food and then you have your survival kit. And if you happen to carry them at the same time, that's your choice. But you should know which is food and which isn't food. Um, so, this actually brings up the sort of psychology of being lost. Your biggest enemy when you're lost is your own mind. Um, apparently, human beings are the only animals that can like scare themselves the way we can scare ourselves. We, you know, we, we intellectualize about what could happen and what could happen, what well, could happen. So, the the common knowledge, the common uh, wisdom here is that you stay busy, right? You always do something, even if it's wrong. <laughs> you always do something that makes you um, feel like you're actually doing something to change the, your situation. The military has a great phrase. They say, do something, even if it's wrong, not too wrong, but even if it's wrong, because if you do something that's wrong, you can correct from it. If you never make a decision, you have what's called analysis paralysis, and you go nowhere, and it feeds on itself. So be very active in your own recovery. Be very active in thinking about what your options might be, and also don't bank ever on one option. You know, the, what is it, all your eggs in one basket, right? You know, if you signal and you think somebody saw you with your signal mirror, don't just use that, right? Use other mechanisms. Make sure, you know, cover all your bases. But stay busy. And also, um, we'll cover shelters in a little bit of, do, is there a board I can write on here? Yeah, there is, okay. Um, so, um, when you build a shelter and when you end up spending the night in the wilderness, and maybe you can comment on this, and, and by the way, please chime in if you have a different experience. Um, if you're in a survival situation and you're not really well prepared, don't expect to sleep at night, right? Expect to survive and make it to morning, but don't really expect to be getting comfortable enough to sleep. People have to find that nighttime is where their head plays with them. And it's two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, you've been cold for a while, your head is just playing with you, playing with you, and that's the toughest time of your whole, of your whole survival experience. And then as the sun comes up, just like, oh, it's a new day, right? Um, you, in fact, you know, you start to become more, uh, you know, more optimistic about what can happen. You know, or the, the sunlight's hitting your eyes and you're getting whatever the drug is that gets released in the brain when light hits your eyes. Um, and, uh, and so just think about the nights as just surviving them. And during the days, you'll be warm, 
you'll probably have some time on your hands, so you'll be able to sleep. So don't worry yourself sick by the fact that you're not really sleeping at night. And, and there are some people who say you shouldn't sleep at night because sometimes people fall asleep and never wake up. So, so but again, it's, the attitude is everything. The guy who... Uh, That's something to worry about. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Rewind. <laughs> um, so um, the gentleman uh, who you know, cut off his own arm because he had to get away from the boulder that had crushed his arm and everything. So uh, several semi-scientific studies came out afterwards to sort of determine what the personality is of a survival. What's a, what's a person who has a good survival personality? And again, it was sort of semi-scientific, but, but it was interesting. And the, the basic premise was that you have a broad spectrum of, cap of emotional capabilities. Like the person who's unbelievably passion passionate, but also really can be really logical and really, you know. Um, so if, you're, if you have sort of traits that are on opposite ends of each other, then they, they sort of say that you have a, a wider range of things to draw on. So I'm, I was going to say bipolar, but that's obviously a whole different thing. Um, but you know, you, some axis, if you're on both ends of that spectrum of that axis, that's considered to be a really good survival trait. So, so uh, don't hold it against us. We should just not go outside. <laughs> well, part of the reason I, I got into search and rescue and everything else was simply that I want more people to enjoy the outdoors. And I want them to have less worries that if things go awry, that they're really on their own. Because the people who are in, in search and rescue, this is all a volunteer thing, many you know, ex-military, and it's really, a, you know, can be a pretty impressive group of people. This is all totally volunteer. This is their passion. And if you're into, if you're into search and rescue, you train a lot. You know, I, if you ever see me uh, in a uh, grocery store line and I'm waiting, I pull a piece of rope out of my pocket and I practice tying my knots, okay? Because you need to know how to tie your prussic blindfolded, you need to be able to feel if your prussic is correctly tied, you need to be able to break the knot and retie it. So, um, so you know, I have to keep my hands busy and this is the safest thing to do in public. Um, so, did I say that out loud? Um, so, um, boy, there's so many toys in here. So, by the way, if you ever um, decide to include matches, and by the way, I don't really think matches are that important, believe it or not. I think uh, unless you really know how to build a fire, and unless you know all the various things, matches are going to give you false hope. Because you're going to be like, oh, I'm just going to create a fire. I got matches, right? There's more to starting a fire than matches, right? So, so in the respect of you stay dry, you stay out of the wind, you seek shelter, you know, it's a rare situation where you're actually going to require matches to survive a night. It might make it more comfortable. But I think the false hope of trying to create a fire, not creating it, and then having that big letdown, oh my god, I didn't create a fire, I'm in big trouble, that's actually much worse. So I have matches, but, but don't worry about them. Um, so uh, this is an ace bandage. And I love ace bandages. And if you're ever in the wilderness and you get hurt, an ace bandage is your friend. But we like to do things multi-purpose. Sometimes we call it highly repurposable. An ace bandage is you know, kind of a generic thing. The best way to carry an ace bandage is in the shape of a t-shirt. And you just cut, you spiral cut, and you end up with an ace bandage. So, um, and if you're lost, you should probably be willing to cut up your t-shirt. That non-cotton t-shirt. So, okay, um, I don't know if I brought this, but Sometimes, and we do this in the field, it's we want to actually have a medical kit. I don't know if I brought it. Um, we want to have a medical kit, and the medical kit is a personal thing, right? Depends on what you think you'll need, right? So if you're, in fact, uh, allergic to bees, you better have your, you know, your, uh, uh, something I can't think of what it's called, the EpiPen. Thank you very much, which I was going to bring today. Um, so you should have your EpiPen. Um, if you're somebody who tends to twist their ankles, you ought to have an NSAID, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Um, the best way to build one of these kits, and no, I don't think I have it here. Best way to build one of these kits is to actually go to Costco, get, get together with about 20 friends, go to Costco and buy the, you know, the 400 count, you know, I don't know, 800 count, whatever they are. The many count thing of acetaminophen, also known as Tylenol, diphenhydramine, which is also known as Benadryl, um, absolutely, uh, I forget what it's called, but the anti-diarrheal medicine. 
right? Because if you get diarrhea in the wild, you're going to lose a lot of moisture, and that's not going to be good for you. Buy all these in the large quantity, and then we buy uh, fly fishing tackle boxes, the little tiny thing like this, and you can put about two days worth of each medication in you know, each of the little compartments, and you have you know, six or eight or whatever the thing is. Um, and and the, the most expensive part of that is the tackle box, because you end up paying about $2 for your emergency medical kit, or, you know, your emergency um, you know, over-the-counter medicine kit. Um, if you're a parent and your children have ever had an allergic reaction to anything, and I mean just like you know, hay fever, buy an EpiPen. An EpiPen is uh, synthetic adrenaline. It's actually, the EpiPen is in a form factor that I think was designed by the, by the Army. It's a self-injecting mechanism. So you inject in the leg. They make them smaller for, for children. And what the EpiPen does is the EpiPen actually helps you deal with anaphylactic shock. And if somebody has ever had an allergic reaction to something, that means that there's potentially something out there that, that maybe they've even interacted with before that will, in fact, cause them uh, to have an anaphylactic shock. And there have been lots of stories of, of people that never been allergic to anything in their life, and they ran into something they never ran into before, and boom. Anaphylactic shock is where your, your res respiratory tissues essentially swell shut. And once they've swelled shut, there's nothing anybody can do for you. You're done. So an EpiPen is synthetic adrenaline, which is a vasodilator. And that vasodilator will, in fact, uh, cause the uh, swelling to go down. And it's the only thing that will save your life in that situation. If I can only take one medical device or medical mechanism into the wilderness, most everything else I can live without. I might be in more pain or whatever else. But when you need an EpiPen, that is the only thing that will save your life. Uh, and don't get just one. Because the first one will cause the, you know, the, it'll stop the swelling from continuing. But after the uh, adrenaline wears off, the body's pretty good at absorbing that. Uh, it will actually, uh, it could actually start up again. So they say minimum of two, realistically four. Uh, you have to get a prescription from a doctor, but as far as I know, they're not, it's not an abuse substance, so I don't think you'll have any trouble. Uh, I don't know how you'd abuse it, but uh, I guess people are adrenaline junkies, so it's possible. Um, so now um, we are recording, so I shouldn't say this, but the, the, there's a, it's also dual purpose. So. Um, if you've ever seen, uh, thank you, Hollywood. If you've ever seen Hollywood where they show somebody flatlining in an emergency room, beep, and they say, oh, quick, he flatlined. Let's shock him. OK, first of all, that's completely wrong. right? You never actually shock somebody who's flatlined. If somebody who's flatlined, there's only one thing that will get the heart started, epinephrine. Okay? The only thing that will get the heart started. The reason you actually use um, an AED is you've got the heart is actually beating. It's just out of sync. The four chambers have to all kind of operate in synchronicity. So the heart's actually like working really hard. It's just no blood's going anywhere. So what the uh, AED does is essentially uh, you know, cause them to have a, a muscle contraction, you know, causes the whole heart to have a big muscle contraction. And then when it lets off, and you know, the, the hope is that the heart will sort of pick back up. So, uh, so you know, now when you're watching with your friends, you can say, oh, yeah, most people have no idea what they're doing. Uh, shock them, you know. So, um, so uh, and then the, so the so the EpiPen, if uh, if somebody's actually had a heart attack, and you're out in the wild, and you know that their um, their it's actually their heart is actually stopped. Uh, technically, they're dead. Okay, you only perform CPR in a dead person. By the way, they don't tell you that, but that's the that's what it is. You only perform CPR in a dead person. So if the person is dead, there's not much you can do to make their situation worse. So, if you have an EpiPen, you know, and there's no beehives nearby, whatever, you know, and, uh, and, and then, you know, in the EMT tradition, I'm a, I'm a wilderness EMT as well, and uh, in the EMT tradition, uh, we have protocols, so we can't do that. But what we can say is, I thought he was having anaphylactic shock. It looked like that to me, you know. I'm just not very good, but that's what I thought it was, yeah. So, uh, Shooting somebody in the leg with an EpiPen and the heart's not beating is not going to get the adrenaline to their heart, right? So, you have so, so actually, um, the, the, the circulatory system and the, that's, the, the body tends to diffuse. So when you put something in, if you, you know, these things go right into the muscle, and they will actually be absorbed to the system. It's better if you actually do it closer up to the heart, right? But uh, I'm not really comfortable giving anybody advice on that. So 
The point is, is that, you know, yeah, if you get the wrong place, Robert said, just stab it somewhere nearby. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> so, um, so there, you know, the body, the body will, and it doesn't actually take much for the heart. It's really strange. I, when I did my EMT rotations, somebody would come in and be like, the heart would stop, they beep, beep, you know, and then pretty soon it's like, Burp, and somebody says, okay, you know, give them, I don't know, so many cc's of epi, and they, you know, beep, beep, just picks right up, and you're like, wow, you know, and then a few minutes later, it wears off, and it's like, beep, 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 you know, and they're like, okay, again, you know, and so you do that two or three times, and you want the body to take up, take over after a while, and if it doesn't, then we call it, but uh, so, um, yeah, you know, it's just, just one of these things you want to, you know, like you can impress all your friends that, that uh, watch in television. Apparently, George Clooney, when he was doing ER, kept saying, uh, said EKG, kept saying KGB, and they couldn't get him to stop saying that, so <laughs> I wonder what that was all about. Uh, <laughs> so, um, let's see. So, okay. Um, pa -pa 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 -pum. Okay, I want to jump to interacting with wildlife a little bit, because this, I think, is something people are interested in. So, first of all, um, there are big things and there are little things in the wild that you need to know about. The big things are um, bears, mountain lions, and uh, what was the other one? I forgot now. People. Well, what's, actually, what mammal, what mammal, other than man, is responsible for the most, most deaths in the United States every year? <coughs> what's that? <coughs> mammal? <coughs> 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 Deer. Yeah, I mean, they're not attacking us, but you know, <laughs> it's worth knowing, right? <clears throat> so, okay. Oh, yeah, snakes, snakes, bears, and okay, I was just trying to think of the three ahead. Okay, so, so um, I want to tell you an urban legend. If, it's, if it is an urban legend, and it probably is, it's still worth hearing because the message is interesting. Um, you know, we, we, we shy away from snakes that rattle because they rattle and they're telling us, hey, you know, get away. Um, and so apparently in places like Texas, again, this may, be, this may be an urban legend, in Texas they have these things called rattle roundups where they actually try to get rid of the, you know, great huge populations of rattlers. And the way they find these rattlers is by their rattles. So what they do is they are selecting all the ones that have rattles and they're killing them. And so now, you can get bit by a rattler, and that rattler does not have a rattle. So um, that may be an urban legend, but I think the point is still is still interesting and still valid. So, um, so you know, for what it's worth, um, the the um, sometimes think of think of the small rattlers. I don't know they're rat rattlets. I don't know what you call them, but um, the baby rattlers um, also have venom, and they haven't actually. <laughs> they're the teenagers. Uh, they haven't actually learned how to modulate the venom. So you can actually get more venom from a baby rattler than you can get from an adult. The, adult, the adults can give you dry bites. They don't want to give up their venom because it takes a lot of energy out of them to create venom. So, so they're, they're, you know, they'll, if they're feeling threatened and you know, they have some, some you know, depending on the situation, um, they may or may not give you venom. But if you get bit by a little one, they may not have a rattle, first of all, at that point, because a rattle is a function of as they get older. Um, so, uh, so any, any snake bite you should deal with as if it were venomous. In, in any situation, in any medical situation, when you are actually, you know, if I get a cut on my arm, the rule of thumb is compression and elevation, right? This is the one place where compression and elevation is not what you do. Compression is bad because you're pushing the venom further into your system, and elevation is bad because now it gets to your heart faster and easier. So you actually want to do somewhat the opposite. You know, you actually want to keep it below the heart. You want to keep that person calm, and you want to, um, and and, you know, whether you, do, well, I won't go into the whole X thing. You draw the thing, blah blah. blah. You have cavities. Um, but the, uh, but sometimes actually even getting, uh, putting it in cold water or cold surface will actually cause um, that part of the of the body to actually. Um, distribute that poison at a slower rate. So if you can actually slow down the absorption of it, uh, depending on how much you got, that's actually okay. Um, so let's see, um, bears, uh, you can intimidate a black bear very easily. You, can, you should not try to intimidate a brown bear. Unfortunately, brown bears are not always brown, black bears are not always black. So, um, and the way you identify them is basically by the shape of their head, et cetera. So, um, you know, the, the thing with bears is that you actually want, you do not want to surprise a bear. 
right? That's the thing. So if you're walking through the wilderness um, and you're by yourself and you think you're crazy for doing this, but you know, just have, hello, Mr. Bear, anybody out there, blah, blah, blah. Just make yourself known because the, the attacks that happen happen because you came up on the bear, you caught him off guard, maybe he's eating, maybe he's, uh, you know, going to the bathroom, right? Because they're vulnerable then and they, they know other people know they're vulnerable then. So, um, so there's a few situations where you're going to really inflame them or, or, you know, young's there, mom's there, bad situation. So, um, so communicate. Uh, just by speaking up, or if you have something which is, uh, you know, two pieces of metal, just make two pieces, you know, click two pieces of metal together. Some people put a uh, cowbell when they hike. They have a cowbell. It just, you know, makes this kind of noise. No, it's not the dinner bell. It's, um, <laughs> it's just something that's not natural. You know, it's not, it's not wood. It's not something the wind is creating by, you know, cruising through trees. So, um, so, uh, and then the other thing is, if you actually come across a bear, first of all, don't run because they have a fight flight reaction. So if you run, it chases. It doesn't know why. It just does, right? <laughs> so, and, uh, and if you're really dumb enough to run, at least run downhill. Because they're very tall in the rear. So if they're running downhill, they very easily lose their balance and roll down the hill. OK? That's you. The bad news is now they're at the bottom of the hill. And they're really good at running uphill because of their body structure. So don't run. Uh, that's the first thing. <laughs> the second thing is, um, if the bear and, and animals will probe each other, they'll kind of check each other out in the wild to kind of figure out what the territory is. You know, maybe you're, maybe bears never seen a person before, or certainly not with this color. You know, so um, so actually, uh, the, the, so if the bear looks kind of interested in you, start talking to him. Doesn't matter what you say, obviously. Um, <laughs> but uh, but the thing is, the bear has a, a, a essentially a, a differencing engine. And you know, as he starts to get a little closer, you start getting a little louder, and you start getting a little more aggressive, and you start showing teeth. And the bear's like, OK, I got the message, right? But if you sit there quiet, right, you're sort of saying, yeah, come on. Come on over, buddy. You know? So animals have a sort of way of negotiating, and you need to play by their rules when you're there. So, um, so just you know, start talking to this bear. And in many cases, they'll be like, yeah, whatever. You know, I've got some berries over here. I'm going to go. So, so, um, and then, you know, I think everybody knows if you're ever attacked by a bear, uh, you're uninteresting if you're dead. <laughs> dead. And so you play dead, and one of the key things is you always stay face down. So if the bear grabs you and kind of flips you over, you know, your momentum carries you all the way around and you end up face down again. So, but, you know, those are pretty rare. The key thing is don't surprise a bear. Mountain lions, um, we don't know as much about mountain lions as we. As we think, it's a it's a pretty solitary animal. They have one mountain lion for 50, uh, five, uh, 50 square miles. And if you've ever seen a mountain lion in the wild, you're fortunate. Um, if you've ever seen a mountain lion and he's crouched and he's looking at you, you're not fortunate. <laughs> so there's a couple of really important things to know here. First of all, if you know if you kind of see him and he's just kind of whoosh, you can kind of get him in profile, it's all good, okay? But We've all, everybody's had or seen at least a house cat, okay? If you've seen a house cat, the way they sort of stalk and everything, you'd be surprised how similar it is to a mountain lion. So, so if the mountain lion, and they have incredible vision, by the way, if a mountain lion is in that position and he's looking at you, predators, by the way, always have their eyes on the, on the, four, on the, on the four, um, their eyes always face forward, excuse me. If you're a prey, your eyes are out here, like a rabbit, you know, the bottom of the food chain. Eyes are out here, right? But predator's eyes are forward. If a mountain lion is looking at you and you make eye contact with him, essentially you've been made. And it knows that, you know, can tell based on the angle. I mean, it knows that you've spotted it. The worst thing you can do at that point is look away. Because what happens is if you go, hey, Joe, that was the opening it had, right? So what you do is you're like, oh, crap, now, I, you know, Joe, come here, you know. And you bring your crowd together. Does anybody have a jacket I can borrow real quick? I want to just show. Thank you. So you bring your crowd together. And uh, wow, that's a jacket. My god. Um, are you from Southern California? Um, so you bring everybody together. So you create, and, uh, and you bring the little ones behind, OK? And um, uh, a mountain lion's model of the world is Everything's a deer or some derivative of a deer, <laughs> right? So, and a deer's got a big neck, and his, his jaw is entirely designed to, is literally perfect, you know, through evolution, if you believe that stuff, um, <laughs> that actually causes, I had to say that, um, that actually can separate the, the vertebra. So, so to, a, to a mountain lion, the more you look like a deer, 
the more you're, you know, the more you look good. And by the way, some people have salt licks in their bad backyard because they want to bring the, the deer close to the house because they're so beautiful. With the deer come the predators. So if you put a salt lick out and your family pets start disappearing, you know why. So one of the things you want to do is you want to make yourself bigger, okay? Something like this makes you bigger and it also starts to break up the pattern. Where's the neck, okay? Because that's what they're all about. I need to know where the neck is. Where's the neck, okay? Get together like this. If you actually have a space blanket, they are make a lot of noise. They've got a weird kind of shininess to them. Those are great for the same thing as well. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> tell your friend, yeah. You don't have to run that fast. You just have to outrun your friend. Um, so, uh, so then the other thing is, and we don't really know why, but there's a really in, unbelievable affinity for children. Like mountain lions have been known to go past, you know, like old decrepit adults, right? They're really easy targets on the edge of the woods to go out into an open field, which is much harder, much more risk, to go after a child. We don't know if it's the sound, simply the size. We don't know, but they, but they are especially interested in children. But what you don't want to do, you make eye contact, and what you don't want to do is bend down to pick up your child, because what are you starting to look like here? <laughs> Anybody kind of seeing the pattern here? So this says, oh yeah, I could, I could be a deer. Sure, why not, you know? And, uh, and the mountain lions that tend to attack people, as far as we know, and we don't have that much data, they are um, the really young, and they haven't quite figured out what they're doing. They're the really old, or they're, um, they've been injured in some way, and uh, for mountain lions, one of the worst things they can do is break a tooth. Break, do they call them canines on a cat? I don't know. Um, <laughs> this is a dog name, right? But if they break one of their four teeth, their, substantially, their ability to be a, a successful predator has been substantially reduced. So in that case, sometimes they'll go after easier prey, and we look pretty easy. So, um, so uh, yeah. So, but mountain lions are pretty rare. And if, they, if an attack ever occurs, they get really fixated on who they're attacking. Right? So if you're there with your buddy and he's being attacked and you're thinking to yourself, okay, if I try to help, that thing's gonna turn on me. And I love my friend, but I, you know, I don't want to be on the receiving end of this. We don't know exactly why, but they're unbelievably fixated. So if you go up, you know, and you kind of help pull it off, the mountain lion will just be like, Ugh! you know, and he'll go right back to where, you know, who he's trying to attack. Um, a very successful strategy is eyes, go for the eyes. That's true, by the way, with people and anything, you know. Uh, eyes are, you know, a predator, if it gets a damaged eye, suddenly is uh, seriously at risk. So don't, like, try to pry the jaws off or, you know, do pick your knife and try to figure where the heart is. Those are, you know, you could be there for a while, like, where's animal anatomy, you know. So, um, so what you want to do is you actually want to, to you know, and they'll, they'll give up real quick when their eyes are in danger. So um, we're running out of time, and there's always so much more to say. Yeah. Um, Child Tsar, put a whistle on your kids anytime they head into the wilderness. Um, uh, international distress symbol is three of anything, three whistle blows, three gunshots. I don't think you should send your kid in the wilderness with a gun, <laughs> but send him in the, in the wilderness. And um, parents, on your way out, come see me. I got whistles. I got lots of stuff, by the way, so on your way out. Um, and, uh, and kids have a tendency of hiding. They feel like they're in trouble. So search and rescue on a child is actually extra challenging. As a family, you need to have a family secret. A family secret, some phrase that it's a secret in your family. And only your family and friends of your family know this secret. And it can be anything. It can be like, you know, you know Barney's left footed, or you know, it could be you know, what your favorite, you know, your favorite pizza type, or just some crazy phrase. They tell us. Then we're in the wild, we're walking around, and it can be a little funny. Oh, Barney has the left footed, you know, Barney's left footed, you know, and the kids will actually then say, okay. This person knows my parents, and okay, I'm not in trouble, and blah, blah, blah. Um, kids are actually really hard because they, they literally try to hide from us. It's just, it's just the way kids are. So um, come up with a family secret and make sure it stays secret, and then you'll have something to give to search and rescue uh, should that ever happen. I'm going to talk briefly about getting found. Do you hike downstream? Do you hug a tree? What's so, <clears throat> so, so first of all, um, has anybody been watching Man vs. Wild? So I have a lot of respect for him, but he does a couple things in there which are just crazy. You do not go down a mountain by going down the face of a waterfall on vines, okay? Most uh, injuries in the wild actually happen near swift water. 
Okay? And so you, know, you have this love-hate relationship with water when you're in the wild because you need it, you want to get to it, you want to get your water um, you know, where it's fast moving and cold. But at the same time, uh, you know, it's easy to get hurt, it's easy to get pulled away. And if you get pulled into the water uh, and you find yourself floating downstream in some river, feet up, you know, feet forward, feet up, of course, but feet forward. <laughs> and if you come across something that looks semi-submerged, do not ever try to swim under it because there's a good chance you'll never come up because they're sweepers. They're essentially trees that have fallen down and been pulled down. And if you get in there, you'll get stuck and you'll just be held down and you'll drown. So we go through all this like crazy training where like we're going down the river and we see this thing and we try to like push ourselves and like jump over, swim over, not really jump, but, and um, it's hard, it's really hard. So stay away from the water if you can. It's the most dangerous place. If you're completely in the absence of all roads, going downhill and following the river is the quickest way to find civilization. With, with children, they have a program called the Hug a Tree program, where if a child is lost, we tell them to stay put. That's where the Hug a Tree idea comes from, because they have a lot of energy and they can climb a lot of places we can't, and they don't tend to follow the profile, right? Like adults would be like, okay, what's the easiest way? Is like, I can go up this hill or I can go down this trail. It's like, I'll go down the trail. Kids are like, I'll go up the hill, you know? So it's much harder to find them. So we just sort of say, stay put, assuming that somebody knows they're out there. Um, so. Uh, so anyways, there's a lot more detail to cover. Uh, Sergey has actually asked me to give a talk on uh, starting a fire with simple wood tools. So uh, I think we may have another talk at some point in the future. Um, and like I said, I have a lot of gear here and I kind of would like people to come by and pick things up. Uh, you know, we have uh, plastic bags, which are part of, uh, should be part of everybody's survival kit. Uh, I have to show off this one thing if it's here. And this is the coolest flashlight I have ever seen. There's been a lot of advances in, um, in LED technology. So this is the flashlight. And it snaps onto a nine volt battery. And uh, you know, depending on the battery and such, I think this is like, has like 100 hours or something. It's unbelievable. And in fact, what people often say is, uh, you know, they pull, they replace their smoke detectors every year. And they pop it in, you know, they you know, take it out of the smoke detector, put it in here, and it's amazing. Um, and uh, this is actually like the most expensive part of your kit. It's going to be like $14. But everything else is like $2, $1, $2. So again, I'm not selling anything. I just am sort of saying that these kits, when put together correctly, can be very inexpensive and very small. And thus, people will actually carry them. Than some of you. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so we're always learning. And in particular, when it comes to interacting with wildlife, because you know, there's only been like you know, 50 cases like, you know, worldwide where we have actually any data, data on mountain lions, for instance. So, um, so yeah. But would people be interested in some kind of follow-up, something more technical, or, you know, I actually have only done about half of what I really could cover here today. Um, I really didn't cover the kit as much as I was hoping. <laughs> um, well, everybody knows about whistles. I told them about the whistles, three things. Uh, and the, Oh, yeah. One last thing. Direction. All you really need is something teeny like this. This is a this is a $4 watch band compass, okay? And the nice thing about it, it's small, you can carry it, and you really, when you're lost, you only need to know within about one eighth, right? I mean, you know, you're not gonna, if you're off by 10 degrees, it's not really gonna make a huge difference. But if you actually, you know, note your direction, you leave, let's say you leave whatever, the car, the house, whatever, um, and you head someplace, and then you decide, um, you know, I'm lost, or I'm not sure where I'm gonna turn around and come back, and you think, okay, I went due north, so now I'm going to turn around and go due south. Um, if there is actually a, uh, if it's like on a road or something like that, don't try to go straight back. Because what will happen is you'll go straight back and you'll get to the road and you'll say, okay, so it's either to my left or it's to my right. So the best thing is to do is to just aim off by, you know, 10 degrees so that you know when, when you hit the road, you have to go right. Um, you'd be surprised how many people, you know, they hit the road, they turn the wrong way, they go for a long distance the wrong way, because they're sure it's just around the corner, just around the corner. Must have been really off, must have been real. By the time they turn around and come back, they've really um, kind of lost their, the mental edge that they have. And you know, these kinds of decisions, surviving has a lot to do with your, your, mental, um, your mental position. And so a lot of the advice I'm giving is things that, you know, don't uh, practice self, uh, uh, what's the phrase I want to, don't, don't practice, um, uh, debilitating, debilitating behavior. Don't practice self. Uh, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Help me here. Thank you. That's it. What you guys said. So, uh, so I would love to do more. So maybe we'll set up another one. And uh, thank you for your patience. And please come by and pick up stuff because otherwise I have to carry it home.